singer, songwriter, Phoebe Snow. Hi, I'm David Levin, and welcome to another episode of Pop Goes the Culture TV. Well, today, I'm bringing you one of my favorite interviews from the ball. Phoebe Snow left us way too young. To call her talented is to give short shrift to her vast and expressive songwriting and to the one-of-a-kind vocal range that this woman possessed. Funny, self-deprecating, and sweet, Phoebe grew up in my hometown, Teaneck, New Jersey, and I remember when I was in high school, everyone knew that this alum had really made good. You can't imagine the impact her first album, her first hit, Poetry Man, had when it hit in 1975. Phoebe seemed to be everywhere back then, and then just as suddenly, she dropped out of sight. Every now and then, you'd hear her voice turn up in a commercial or in the opening of the show, A Different World. The birth of her daughter was both a tragedy and an enormous blessing that changed the course of her life. But in this conversation, Phoebe was open and candid and honest and wonderful. We hit it off partly because of our hometown connection, partly because our mutual friend Paul sat in on the interview. Over the course of her conversation, we talked about how her daughter impacted her career. We talked about songwriting, what it was like being on the second ever Saturday Night Live, how she met the Beatles, Bruce Springsteen, B.B. King, B.B. Cates, Bill Clinton, and even Captain Kangaroo. But we begin at the beginning. Well, let's sort of go back to those, those early, that early stuff. Mm. We'll work our way forward and maybe we'll go a little non-linear, but we'll play and and see what some of the, some of the, when, when did you first sort of know that you wanted to do more than just sing in the shower? Singing in the shower. The house, singing yeah. in the shower? Um, I always fantasized about doing that, but I never in a billion years thought that I would actually do it for a living. So I'm as surprised as you are. I took guitar lessons from the time I was about 12 or 13, thinking my real fantasy initially was I'm going to be an A-list session guitar player. All the rock people are going to call me to play on their record dates, but they're not. I'm never going to. But I thought, never singing. I will never have the courage to do that. So it's remarkable. I have no idea what changed. I just, my very first boyfriend encouraged me a lot. And I think because I had such a big crush on him, and it was not reciprocal, I thought this is how I would win his heart, you know? I would sing because he liked it. Isn't that the way it always happens? That's, that's what I've heard. It's trying to impress somebody. <laughs> David Crosby told me the reason he started singing was because he wanted to meet girls. That's right. Oh, all the, all the guy rock stars say that. They got into it because they wanted to meet chicks. I wanted to meet guys. <laughs> How'd that work out? Not well. <laughs> Not well at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you got to sing though. I did. Amazing people. I, I mean, did. How did when did when did people start to sort of notice you? When did, what did, I know you started to go to to the village. I mean, what would oh, you yeah. put yourself out there? Right. I there were amateur nights for singer songwriters back in the early late sixties, early seventies, and they they were called talent nights or hoot nanny nights. I don't even remember. And I just sort of forced myself to go, largely at the urging of this first guy that I went out with. He said, you've got to get up there. And I was so shy. I was like mortified. I really, I, I really didn't want to do it. But the more I got into the swing of it, I started really doing it on a regular basis. And um, I've met a lot of people back in the day when I was just Phoebe the singer, songwriter, the little folk singer. And um, this is where I got to tell my first story, which is there was a lot of excitement. After I'd been doing it for about eight months, there was a lot of excitement at this one club, the Gaslight on McDougal Street. It was a teeny club. I think now it's like a Middle Eastern restaurant. But it was seated about four people. And it was a great showcase room back then. And everybody wanted to do these little rooms. The Bitter End the, and the Gaslight were like hot rooms to because record company people were coming down. And the big buzz this one night is Bruce Springsteen. This guy, Bruce Springsteen, was going to audition for the venerable John Hammond. And I think some people have probably heard his name in connection with Bob Dylan. They, he supposedly found Benny Goodman. He found Bessie Smith. He found Billie Holiday. So he was like an icon. 
And we were all like freaking that he was coming to this club. And um, the key spot of the night was to go right before or right after Bruce Springsteen. And the guy who was emceeing that particular talent night said, don't worry, Phoebe, you're in. I've got you right after Springsteen. I said, okay, you know. So I'm waiting patiently. And the night of the show, the MC, who I have just spoken to for the first time in 30 years, and I will not mention his name because he was horrified when I told him. He said, I didn't do that. I said, oh, yes, you did. He told me about 20 minutes before Bruce Springsteen went on, I've had to move you. There's someone that I really need to do a favor for. You can fill in the blanks in your own mind. And she has to go on right after him. So I've got to move you. And I freaked. I was like, but I want to audition for John Hammond. He goes, I know, Phoebe. I'll try to keep him here. But I have to do this. I promised someone. I was like, all right. Bruce Springsteen goes on. And my memory of his performance was he played ballads, a few ballads on a piano and just sang with a piano. And he might have even had that harmonica thing, I don't know. He was great. He was great. But we were all very cynical little hippie kids. We were like, ah, who's he to get John Hammond to come in? Who is this guy? And we were told he's virtually already signed to what was then Columbia. So it's just like a formality. He wanted to just hear him doing a performance. Anyway, Springsteen finishes. And the other girl gets up that takes my spot that I was supposed to have. And John Hammond stays for her set. And we see, we're all watching him in the audience. And he gets up at the end of her set and he goes, I got to go to another club. And he's talking to the guy, the MC. And I run over to the table. I was devastated. And John Hammond says, is there anybody else that I should see here tonight? And... The MC said, well, there's Phoebe here. Phoebe's great. And he looks at me and goes, yeah? Hmm. He says, well, I, I do have to go to this other club and see this other act. I, I'll try. When is she going on? Oh, and about three or four other people. Well, I'll try to come back. And I feel my heart just going like this. I'll try to come back. And he gets up and leaves. And I follow him out in the street cause at a safe distance watch him leave and burst into tears. And I'm standing on the sidewalk with my guitar strapped to my shoulder, by the way, sobbing. And I'm out there, I don't know how long, and Bruce Springsteen comes out, you know, just kind of standing around, looking around. And he sees me and he goes, what's the matter? And I said, oh, Mr. Springsteen, how did you get John Hammond to discover you? And I'm sobbing, I'm a basket case. And he, oh, he says, oh, what's your name? I says, Phoebe. He goes, Phoebe. He gives me a big hug. He's, he's such a great guy. And he's just standing there hugging me. He goes, don't worry. Someone will discover you, too. Are you sure? Oh, I think I might have been really audacious at that point, as shy as I was, and said, can you ask John Hammond personally for me if he would like to? <laughs> we were just terrible. Anyway, so that was like 1972. And I went on to make my first album in 74, and it did very well. In 1977, I get invited to a huge press event at a gigantic loft somewhere in downtown Manhattan. And the, now, Bruce Springsteen was now blowing up like crazy. He was the man. He was like a deity. And whoever was managing me back then said, you know, you really ought to be there. Springsteen's going to be there. I went, oh, yeah, I'll be there. So there's a press area, like a... a VIP kind of press thing and big photo op thing. And they have me go over there and wait. They said, he's coming in, so I want we want the handshake shot with you guys. I want you to meet him. So I all meet him. And um, he comes in and we do the handshake. And he says, well, it's very nice to meet you. I like your uh, music. And I said, we've met. And he looks at me and goes, no, we haven't. I think I remember that. And I said, by the way, any one of you can ask him about this, because I'll bet he remembers still. He said, no, we've already met. I said, he, I said, we've already met. He said, no, we haven't. I would remember. I said, oh, yes, we have. This is great. It was really, and there's like 100 photographers flashing away. 
Um, he said, well, I would have remembered. Where do you think we met? I said, oh, I know we met. Remember when you auditioned for John Hammond at the Gaslight in the Village in 1972? And he was like, yeah. I said, remember there was a girl outside crying? And how did you get him to... And he stops dead in his tracks. He goes, oh, my God. That was you. It was great. Great moment. Total validation. In my history. Great on my bio, yeah. Oh, that's Total great. validation. And every time I see him, we say, Gaslight. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Mm. That's a very cool full circle it's, story. It's nuts. Yeah. But in the meantime, so between the gaslight and this iconic, you know, photo op, other stuff happened. It's like Tons. You skip over that stuff. Tons. I don't even know where to start. Where do we well when did so so John Hammond didn't discover you at that point? No. So who did? Well, it was a man named Dean Ira Dino Arali, who worked for Shelter Records, which was a small indie label, which at the time was co-owned by Leon Russell. Anybody out there? I hope they remember Leon Russell. I've been so many places in my life and time. Yeah, he still works all the time. And an English guy named Danny Cordell who had discovered Joe Cocker. And it was Joe Cocker and the Mad Dogs and Englishmen that gave birth to this small label. And that's the first, th that guy, Dino, who worked for promotion for them, discovered me. He literally, it was like a Cinderella story. He heard me at the bitter end, not long after the Bruce Springsteen thing happened, and they signed me. And I made my first album. What did that I, feel like for you? Crazy. Crazy. Gave me, by the way, any musicians out there will appreciate this. When Dino first approached me, when I had done an amateur night, at the bitter end, and he came up to me and he said, "I want you." He said, "This is just a formality. I want you to make a demo for us. You know, like a, you know, what a demo is." Right? And he says, um, "Here's forty dollars. <laughs> Go make a demo." So I just took five of my friends out to dinner, and I figured I'll just do it, you know, for free. Still scamming, always scamming. <laughs> we, but we got some good food out of that. Yeah, yeah we're cheap. <laughs> um, Probably one of those falafel places around there, but everybody ate good that night. Because we were panhandling. I mean, we really did. We were hippie folk singers. We didn't have any money. So, um... How old were you at the time? Uh, I'm trying to think. When did this all start? I probably about 20 or 21. Yeah. <laughs> and shy. A little shy Violet. Ooh, yes. Amazing. I know. How I got up on that stage in the beginning. I still can't figure it out. Now, is there a difference between singing sort of in your shower or on the stage or in a studio? Mm -hmm. And what are the differences for you? Well, for me now, it's most gratifying to get up in front of people because there's instant feedback, even if they hate you. And you hope they don't hate you. And even if they hate you, you can turn that into great comedy. I've done some of my best shtick with people really not being happy with me. And, and I would start a dialogue. Like, really, what's what's upsetting you, sir? What you want to discuss it with me? I'm nuts on stage. I went from barely being. Oh, this is some people don't understand this, and I myself don't. Understand, barely being able to open my mouth on stage. In fact, my nickname with the old group of folk singers that I hung out in the beginning was Clenched Teeth, because I would sing like this. I was like so paralyzed with fear on stage and now it's just like okay it's a free-for-all everybody's in the act I don't know the concept of it being entertainment just caught on with me at some point and I just said we're up here to have a good time so let's have one even if that guy over there is really pissed at me I can wor I could work that into the act and he'll know that he can be part of this and they just get into it you know so even hatred doesn't last long. You're supposed to be entertaining these people. So. Was there a point at which you started writing your own stuff? Oh, before I, actually even before I performed, that was another thing I thought, well, I could be in publishing. I could be a great songwriter. Mm -hmm. mm, everything was so great. Um, so I, I actually wrote, I don't know if I told you about this. The second song I ever wrote was my biggest hit single, which is Beginner's Luck. I have no idea how that happened. But there was one song before that, which is all I remember, but it's gone, it's in the ozone. I have no idea what happened to it. All I remember is 
the hook. <laughs> oh, no. Go for it, baby. Okay, I'm revealing something here. <laughs> oh, my God. This is really embarrassing. It was called... <laughs> and I thought I was just being the hippest chick that ever lived. It was called, Can You Get Behind That Baby? And I remember singing it for my mother. And she just, you know, my mother was great. She just looked at me and she goes, what, what is that about? I said, it, I don't know. It's like I'm being hip. <laughs> it was terrible. But I would love to know where that song is. And I would actually, I'm so audacious. I would resurrect that song now. I would actually do it now just to, just to get a rise out of people. Like, hey, you want to hear the first song I wrote? It, it sucked. It was terrible. Have you, have you ever heard Paul McCartney sing his first song? No. It's what is it? Real, I know. It's a stupid little song. Excellent. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I think I did. But what is it? Do you know? I, I don't remember what it I was. I would love to hear that. Again. But it's just like, it's like this stupid little ditty. wasn't as bad like, as mine. It's like, he's like. <laughs> You know, you get past the point at which you're embarrassed about your first stuff. You know, when you get, when you get a certain body of work, you know, yeah. like you're embarrassed about it because you don't want people to know, and then you get to remember, what the hell. Oh, who cares, go. right? <laughs> well, speaking of Paul McCartney, I can say this. Now that I've told you my Bruce Springsteen, I have actually met all the Beatles. Oh, really? And a lot of my peers, I was shocked to find out, never met the Beatles, any of them. People my age who've been in the business as long as I am, like, you haven't? I thought sooner or later the, Be they, the Beatles were ubiquitous and they just met everybody. But I actually, um, did we talk about George Harrison? Oh, God. That's another one. I just remembered this now because you said Paul McCartney. Wait, I have to scratch my nose. I'm okay, don't worry, we won't show it on TV. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> it wasn't too gross. Okay. No, it was at a party. When I was in LA, I was touring, unbeknownst to myself at the time I was pregnant. I just thought I had an ulcerative stomach. <laughs> Isn't that a laugh? Well, they told me, doctors told me I could never get pregnant. So I was shocked. I mean, I, and I toured in the first trimester, but, you know, amazing. Anyway. I'm, I'm reminiscing here. Um, this is what we're here for. Uh, we are? We're here is this is a therapeutic kind this of environment. Is your, this is your uh, debriefing. Well, I'm, I don't think I've ever really talked very much about this, but the party was at Ringo's house in Laurel Canyon, and through a series of different people, I knew this woman that he was li with, Ringo was living with at the time, and one of her friends invited me. They said, after you finish your gig in L.A. with Jackson Brown, I was opening for Jackson Brown, Hi, Jackson. Um, it was my very first national tour. Come over to Ringo's party. And George Harrison and Olivia, his wife, came to the party. And I actually spent almost the entire evening talking to George Harrison in a, in a room that was sort of a little bit off from the main area where all the people were hanging out. People would come in and out occasionally, but the dialogue was largely between himself and me. What do you talk about with? Songwriting. Mostly songwriting. There were a couple of awkward moments where I said he he went almost into interview mode, like he was on autopilot at one point. He said, "Well, my biggest influences were Elvis and Chuck Berry," and I'm like, "Am I in a TV show here?" I mean, I didn't ask him. He just kind of a switch flipped. He was so programmed to do that. But once he chilled out, and once he was just like, "Hey, we're just talking here," the first thing. One of the conversation openers, the very first things that he said to me is, it's very emotional now, he said, I really like your songwriting, not my singing. He said, did you write, you wrote those songs, didn't you? It was my first album. Ooh, see, I got emotional there. I said, you like my songwriting? Holy crap. And, um, <laughs> but the, what I was going to say was, after he went into his sort of automatic, here's who my biggest influences were, and who were yours? And I was like, the Beatles. <laughs> and he went into about a 20-minute speech about how now that was the past, you know, and where there are no Beatles, just so that you know, there are no Beatles anywhere. I'm like, okay, we don't have to talk about it. Forget it. It was somebody else anyway, you know. And then he said, would you ever be, oh, God. would you ever be up for co-writing? 
Have I not told you this? These are my precious Holy jewels God. of memories. I said, you mean... Well, I'll get you, get you a copy of this DVD. <sighs> yeah, I'm going to... So you can have it all ready for your book. Yeah, my book. My alleged book. Boy, have I got a book. Oh, boy, have I, that should be the title. <laughs> oh, boy, have I got a book for you. <laughs> Believe me, the stuff I'm leaving out is going to have to be, there will have to be multiple volumes of this book. Okay, that's all we've got time for for now. In part two, my conversation with Phoebe Snow continues with her story about meeting George Harrison, Poetry Man, being on the second episode of SNL, The Birth of Her Daughter, plus her pseudo-psychic premonitions of fame. I'm David Levin. See you then. Thanks for watching, and please subscribe. <laughs> <laughs>